I got off the plane last night. I, my plane was late because it's negative 20 in Iowa right now. Um, and I got to the hotel, and I walked up to the front desk, and the guy at the front desk, you know, being nice, chatted me up a little bit, and he said, oh, why are you here? You know, I see you're here for a conference or something. And I said, yeah, I'm going to talk about school tomorrow. And he goes, oh, cool. Uh, what are you going to say? I'm like, well, I'm like, do you have 17 minutes? <laughs> and he, he says, and I, I gave him sort of a, you know, a Midwestern non-answer, right? Like, uh, oh, you know, just kind of how I, I think school could be, could be better, and I kind of have, like, this neat school I run, and, you know, just all that, and just kind of smiling. He's typing and, you know, getting my cards ready and all that. And, um, and he says, well, you know, give me the elevator speech on it. What, what, what is your school? And I'm like, okay. Well, it's, it, we, we don't have walls. We don't have grades. We don't have bells. We don't have a building. Um, we don't have courses. And the, the kids love it. <laughs> right? <laughs> and he's typing. And he just looks up from the screen and he goes, well, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe I have a bit of a harder sell today uh, to you all. But uh, the first point I'd like to make is something that gets said a lot. Um, and I'd like to make the opposite point. Uh, school's not broken, right? Uh, school does exactly what it was designed to do. And don't kid yourself. And when I say school, I mean the sort of drudgery, traditional school we all love to you know, hit the speed bag on a little bit. Uh, school's not broken. It sorts kids. That's what it does. Um, whether we like it or not, it sorts kids by time. And it sorts them by how fast they do certain things. And I know lots of schools, especially schools like this, uh, avoid that. And they, they do a really great job of fixing that. But in the end, they're optimizing a system that doesn't have very many really good optimization points. Um, and my schools are the same way, the places I've worked. Um, and I, I think it's a piece of evidence for that point, which can come, out, come across as a little dark, is the concept of the snow day. And I don't know if you have too many of those here in Seattle, but when it's negative 20 in Iowa, and you literally can't walk outside, the weatherman says, you have five minutes. Five minutes to what? Five minutes until you die. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we, we cancel school because of that, and for really good reason, obviously. And you know what the kids do? They celebrate. They're happy about it. They can't wait. You know, they kind of click their heels together like a leprechaun, and they like, couldn't wait to possibly miss out on school. In fact, there's a website called Snow Day Calculator, if you haven't been there. It calculates the probability based on machine learning that there will be a snow day based on the forecast for your area. That's how much people like snow days. <laughs> now think about that. It's ha ha ha, funny, funny, funny. Let's all laugh about kids not liking school, but seriously, kids not liking school. Like that's a problem. That's a problem that as a professional educator, I laugh at inside, but every time like my heart shrinks like the Grinch a little bit, and I think to myself, I want to build a school that kids want to go to. I want them to cry when they leave. I want them to be so sad that they can't continue their project until 9 o'clock at night because we have to turn the lights off because I'm tired. I want that. And I want that really, really bad. And I, I'm fortunate enough to be on a team of people in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, of all places, to try and build a team, a school like this. And it was not an easy effort. Um, and I'd like to point out a success story that we have. In fact, uh, this is Kinsey Farmer, and she's one of the first students to enroll in uh, the school that I built with my team. Uh, the school is called Big. And she came into my office, as all of the students do that enroll in Big. She sat down on the desk and she said, well, what are we going to do today? And I said, well, what do you like? And, you know, that starts to be a little wishy-washy. She's the first kid, right, so we don't really have this protocol worked out. And <laughs> then I said, okay, we'll ask you a better question. What, when you wake up in the morning, what are you mad about? What bothers you that it's not fixed? What, what gets your goat a little bit? And she said, you know what? And I thought she was going to, like, lay something really heavy on me. She goes, I don't like the way boys treat girls. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I'm thinking, my like, brain goes dark, and I'm thinking, hmm. 16-year-old doesn't like the way boys treat her. What am I going to do with this? Like, this school is like sunk before it begins, right? And I say, well, okay, keep going. Tell me more. What are you mad about at that? And she says, I think there's a fundamental inequity built into the way that we treat men and women in America. And that makes me mad because I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to a good college. I'm going to go to Notre Dame. So her words, not, you know, I don't care about Notre Dame. Uh, I'm going to go to Notre Dame. I'm going to spend a lot of money. I'm going to go into debt. I'm going to be 22 when I graduate. I might go to grad school. And then I'm going to have to figure out whether I can get a job that makes that money back because I'm a girl. Or I, maybe I should just start a family because I'm a girl and I'm going to be 22 and stuff's going to be rough for me there. And I thought, whoa, like, this is beyond my ken here. Like, this is like, 
like, whoa, I did not expect this conversation, Miss Farmer. And I looked at her and I said, that's a project, isn't it? That's a serious project. She has some very serious questions there. Uh, and so we went through, and with her help, we developed the prismatic monoceros of project design, <laughs> which is another way to say like unicorn rainbow, because you can't say that anymore, because it's not cool, it's been overdone. But uh, I, I looked at her and I said, you know, okay, here's how we're going to build this project. You know, th this is a topic that I'm not sure I'm capable of teaching you about, but I know you're going to learn a lot through it. You're going to learn about neurology, you're going to learn about history, you're going to learn about genetics, you're going to learn about the waves of feminism, and there have been three, and I guess arguably four, the Wikipedia keeps getting edited, but <laughs> does your project that you want to do fit these? And she pitched the school, so she pitched to their kids, she pitched to the other faculty what she wanted to do, and at first it was just a bunch of sociology research projects at her current home base school that she was attending um, also. And we said, you know, those, those aren't really working out. In fact, what we got to have to make these projects work at big, because uh, the kids have helped design this, uh, this is our first year. What we're going to have to have is a personal interest, it's got to be interdisciplinary, and most important, it's got to have an external audience, and that's the thing that catches up most kids. An audience outside the school that cares about what you're doing. That's tricky. It's really hard for, to find a project that does all three of those. And here's the worst part, it's a really thin band of success. If you miss any of those, you end up in one of the three areas where stuff doesn't work. And this is often the area where most reform initiatives live. Um, you can think of schools within a school where you have a team of teachers teaching interdisciplinary, and they bring the engineer in to come in and assess the student's work. And like, look at this roller coaster they built. Isn't that great? But in the end, we all know that the students come across a little bit forced. The projects come across a little bit like they were pushed through the, the Play-Doh musher right at the end, and they're just afraid of what the engineer might say. Um, and th there, there's other things that happen when you only hit two of these things. And I'm not saying that that's bad teaching, because I've done those things. I do those things constantly. What I'm saying is that we're being asked to optimize a system where we can't optimize that. The, getting all three of these things done requires a complete and total change in the way we think about how we use time and space. And it's a terrifying change. Um, one of the things I read about in the newspaper quite a lot is that teachers and parents and administrators and kids should just try harder. And as I'm designing big, as I'm building this program with these students, as we're writing the constitution of this school together, I keep hearing people tell me, well, should, can't we just try harder? The answer to that question is no. And I don't want anyone to put that on themselves. I don't want any teacher to come across with the panic attacks I had to have over trying to just make my calculus class and those 80 minutes a day I got with those 30 kids to make that work perfectly. That's an exercise for an anxiety disorder. And it doesn't work that way. The only person that ever tells a teacher to try harder or a kid to try harder, and that's the only way we're going to get perfect education, is someone who has never, ever taught. So what do I care about instead? I care about my kids' resumes. And I, this, is a, this is a point of contention, right? I don't mean to say, like, we're going to just trump up a bunch of kids' resumes. What I'm trying to say is, I want those kids to have something to write about when they write those college entrance exam or essays. I want them to actually say, like, I built this prosthetic hand that operates over Wi-Fi that you can move your own muscles, and it reads the sensors into an Arduino board, and it crawls across the room. I built that. That's something to write about. The trials and tribulations of building something like that, the things you have to learn to do something like that, is something that a person can actually put on their application. And that's what I want to build. And I don't know if that's something that kids should be doing 100% of the time. I don't know if that's something kids should be doing 50% of their time. But all I know is it's something that they should be doing. Uh, currently, where we're at right now, and this is our flyer. Sorry, that's pretty dense. This is a flyer we produced after two months of operation uh, as a public school. And we had kids that did all sorts of great stuff. But the best thing is a kid cured his own bacon. Right? And he put electrodes in it. So imagine a, a big old side of pork. And sorry if you're a vegetarian, right? But a big old side of pork. And He's got electrodes sticking in it, and he's measuring resistivity and conductivity, try to figure out when the salt ions get to wear in the bacon until it's perfect, right? It was an amazing project, and he won a purple ribbon at the state fair, because Iowa, and did you know, <laughs> did you know that there's purple ribbons? Because I didn't, right? It's one step above blue. Um, but we're not about grades and stuff, so like, forget that. Uh, our, our students spend 12 to 50% of their time with me. Uh, and that's not 100%, and we don't know if it should be 100%. We're going to try some experiments next year. Uh, but currently, that's, that's what they do. Um, how do I know this is working? Uh, I had a kid apply last week, and I asked him, why do you want to go to big? And he said, oh, I want to learn how to do video production, and I have some stories I want to tell. And I said, OK, well, what school do you go to now? And he goes, well, should I graduated already. 
and I'm in college, but I think I want to do this too. And I thought, hmm, something is working. Now, I want to take a step back. I want to rewind. How does a, a community get the license to do something like this? And the answer is, for Cedar Rapids, we were destroyed. Uh, there was a flood. I don't know if you remember this. Back in 2008, uh, we lost 12 square miles of our downtown. That's culture. That's low-income housing. That's high-income housing. That's utilities. I mean, it was a it was a 75-mile route to get from the north to south side of Cedar Rapids to, for a semi to get around on roads like that. I mean, it was a serious deal. And after the city was destroyed, people asked the question, how do we rebuild? Do we just rebuild the same thing, or do we rebuild better? And the answer was, we rebuild better. And I got to be on the team that was going to figure that out, and we instantiated a project called the Billy Madison Project which you can imagine exactly what that is, right? And then Universal Pictures called us and said, you can't say that. So <laughs> it's, in fact, actually the Back to School Project. Uh, and Iowa Transform Ed is the name of this sort of community building endeavor in education. Um, and the things that the people at the Billy Madison Project said were that kids need to plan their time. They need to fail into something better. They need to find joy in their work. And they need to schedule and communicate during their day. No one ever said anything about curriculum. We even prompted them. Talk about your job as an engineer. Talk about your job as an analyst. No one would say anything about curriculum. They wouldn't say anything about the five bullet points that describe Egypt or the factoring quadratics. And that blew my mind. I thought I would for sure get business people to tell me, oh, they need to know how to use Excel. No one would, would really put that out there and say they had to do that. And so that led me to think, Maybe there's something about time and space here, right? Maybe there's something to the fact that we're not thinking fourth dimensionally, Marty, right? There's something to this that we're going to have to work around. And that thing became big, right? And the most important thing that big has is a really amazing mascot, right? <laughs> uh, we are the big fighting whale elephants uh, because we couldn't decide which was bigger, a whale or an elephant, right? Um, <laughs> And that's actually not totally approved. They're going to be mad that I showed you that. <laughs> but uh, what we really have is curriculum by democracy. When a kid walks up like Kinsey and she pitches her project, the other students and the faculty help her decide whether that's worth doing. We actually have a, a funding vote, which sometimes is for actual money and sometimes isn't. The kids vote, and when they vote them down, it then goes to advisory committee. Everyone decides whether that project is worth fixing. And that's an amazing way to design a curriculum for a school, because you'd be surprised how 10th graders would say like, things to their peers. You know, I don't know if you're going to learn enough from that. Maybe you could. Maybe you could. And it becomes so real. And so we really ask the question, is the world interesting enough? When the community comes to us and pitches us projects, uh, we had a homeless person come pitch to us to design a food bank for his side of town. And it would be a food bank where uh, staffing agencies could set up kind of a, a co-working space food bank. And you know, when he pitched that to my students, they all immediately dropped what they were doing and said, you know, we, we'll work on that for a week. The lectures and the, the direct instruction are on demand, right? We have an IT system that keeps track of that, right? So I, every kid has a profile. I dump links in there. When they schedule direct instruction with me, I provide it with them. So they're scheduling it in Google calendars. The only rule at my school is you produce or you leave. And that doesn't mean that you get expelled and like, you have to go live in a van down by the river. This means that you, you just go back to another school. You pick a different option. You find an option that works for you. And if big's not working for you, like, go, go be fruitful somewhere else, please. But he, here what we do is we produce things, and we keep track of curriculum as we learn it. Uh, so I want to point out a piece of time here. Uh, this is what a normal student's day looks like. This is what a normal student's week looks like. And this is what a normal student's month looks like. And this could be any month of the year, and in fact, for some students, it's every month of the year. Now, I want to ask a question. Do you really want to do that? Is there a reason that kids love snow days? And I think you're looking right at it. At big, we tend to fill the picture up of Project X, and then once it's full, we pour it out into what we all, teachers, some, for some reason, need to know of as courses. So I know that Kinsey needs to work on marketing, because when she finishes this project, Success to the Power of She, and she puts that conference on, and I saw that the marketing wasn't so hot. She's not proficient in those standards. She's going to look at that after that project is over and say, oh, that's where I need to work. This is McKenna. McKenna is entering the Google Science Fair. Uh, she's been analyzing how wastewater can be treated by dormant trees, which we thought was impossible, but she has, in fact, shown that there is an 
an actual effect of reducing the nitrate, phosphate, and E. coli levels in wastewater, uh, McKenna's project can be so easily tracked to chemistry and environmental science. But without, by putting her in those, those containers, she never would have done this. She never would have had to design this pumping system, these crazy gutters that she did not want to build, by the way. She would not have put this insulation around her trees to try and keep the soil temperature of these trees, uh, what, uh, what the actual soil temperature would be. She wouldn't have done those things if there hadn't been an external audience watching her, the, the people who run this wastewater plant. Um, and so I just can't, I, again, I, I hope that the joy of this like spills out. Like I, I love doing this. Going to visit her at this wastewater treatment plant of all the places to want to go to, that's one of the highlights of my week. <laughs> oh, we're hanging out by the secondary fermentation tank today? <laughs> Whee! You know, like I can't wait. And I want to remind you we're doing this in Iowa, right? We're doing this in the city that is the test market for Frito-Lay. Remember these? <laughs> right? We are Joe every city. Cedar Rapids has 130,000 residents, and it has 48% free and reduced lunch, which is your standard measure of poverty. That's pretty on par with the rest of the United States, if you want to chew on that for a second. This is not a joke. This is not a bunch of gifted students doing gifted things to go to gifted places. Right? This, is my, this is my calling. This is my solution to the poverty cycle, which is why I think I'm a teacher. I think that building their resumes is the reason that we ought to do this. And we're doing it in seven counties, <clears throat> and we're doing it with kids that want to be there. I asked a student, what's the biggest problem with big? <laughs> She's in my other classes, because we don't have them all day, right, yet. And I'd like to introduce you finally to Toy Gideon, uh, who is from Tanzania. And I'm not sure why, why he's here. He won't tell me about it. Uh, but he's here, and he just got here. And he came to me and said, I want to join big. I want to learn to make music. And I said, you're not going to learn just to make music. Through your project, you're going to mark it on iTunes. You're going to learn how to write audio units. You're going to learn how to program. You're going to learn how to play instruments you can't play. Are, are you with me on that? And he said, yeah, I just want to make music. And I said, I just want to play you his first tune. This is after two months uh, of working. Toy produces music completely in Swahili, uh, and he produces it in seven-part harmony, and I don't know where he got that, uh, but, but we're pushing him on it, and we're teaching him music theory through that. And it, it's an unreal experience to be able to work with this student. And so my, my final point here is, this is a school that's happening in, in Joe Every City, and if you think this is a cool option for your students, I want to work with you. I want to talk about this. I want to do this together, because uh, I can't tell you how much joy I have in doing this with students. Thank you very much. <laughs>